Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the North Dakota Department of Health COVID-19 Town Hall on Testing and Treatment. I am Molly Howell, and I'm the Immunization Director for the North Dakota Department of Health. We have three great speakers here today who are also here to answer any questions you have around COVID-19 testing and treatment. Uh, so I'll introduce our speakers first, and then we'll get started with our presentation. Our first speaker is Kirby Kruger, who is Section Chief of Disease Control at the North Dakota Department of Health. Kirby has been with the Department of Health for over 30 years, working in infectious disease and injury surveillance. He has been published in various peer-reviewed journals, including CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report and the New England Journal of Medicine. Our next speaker is Dr. Christy Mason. She serves as the North Dakota Department of Health Chief Laboratory Officer. She has been with the department since 2012. Christy earned her graduate degrees from the University of North Dakota, and she is also a licensed medical laboratory scientist. Dr. Mason is also an educator with 14 years of teaching experience. She is employed at the University of Cincinnati and is also the Medical Laboratory Technician Program Director for Minnesota State Community and Technical College. She currently serves as the American Society of Clinical Laboratory Science, North Dakota's Constituent Society President. In addition, she serves on the National Accrediting Agency for Clinical Laboratory Science Board and the North Dakota Board of Clinical Laboratory Practice. And then our final speaker, we're thrilled to have with us here again, Dr. Joshua Ranham. Uh, Dr. Ranham grew up in the rural southwestern town of Scranton, North Dakota. After completing his residency, he returned to North Dakota with his family in 2012 and has been actively practicing as an internal medicine physician at West River Health Services in Hedinger since that time. He currently serves as the vice president of the North Dakota Medical Association and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Over the past year, Dr. Ranham has been instrumental in providing subject matter expertise, promoting increased utilization of, and driving the state's campaign to surge awareness surrounding life-saving monoclonal antibody therapies with the state's VP3 team, the Vulnerable Population Protective, Protection Plan. These effective therapeutic options have been proven to divert the need for hospitalization and reduce severity of illness when given early on, thus directly resulting in the preservation of statewide hospital capacity and most importantly, saving lives by reducing mortality among our most vulnerable population. So thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. I also do wanna mention that none of our speakers have any financial disclosures, meaning they're not receiving any compensation by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so I think we'll get started and I will turn it over to Kirby to provide us with an update on COVID-19 in North Dakota and some testing information. Are you seeing my slides, Molly? Yes, we are. Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, and so what I wanna do today is just provide a brief update on where we're at with uh, COVID-19 in North Dakota. Um, I'll also be talking a little bit later in the presentation on ivermectin, but just to get us started, we'll just go over a brief overview of, of what's happening in North Dakota who should be tested, and then we'll talk about ivermectin. Just a brief update, uh, we're at 
2,590 active cases as of this morning in North Dakota. That is an increase, um, a fairly significant increase from where we were at the beginning of August. And so our cases are continuing to increase quite a bit. Um, our positivity overall has increased quite a bit. In fact, more than sixfold um, since the beginning of August or end of July, uh, where uh, we were at 1.1%, now we're at 6.6%. So overall, we are seeing uh, increases in disease. We're seeing increases in um, positivity. Uh, and so we're also seeing increases in hospitalizations and deaths associated with these increases. And so it's important to, to know that uh, we have a lot of transmission occurring in North Dakota right now um, and that we are still steeply climbing upwards with our, our case rates. Just looking at uh, the data for K through 12 uh, for the last school year and so far this school year, um, you can see that in red, that's the current academic school year, the 2021-2022 school year. And you can see that the number of cases occurring in the K through 12 uh, age group is uh, pretty significantly increased compared to last year. Um, and just, uh, I was looking at some other data related to this uh, too. Since March of 2020, um, the zero to 19 year olds has a, have accounted for 18%, just a little over 18% of all of the cases of COVID-19 in North Dakota. But in the last week, that uh, percentage for zero to 19 years of age has ranged from 27% to 36%. So we are seeing more cases in, in younger individuals. Uh, the, the proportion of cases that were, are occurring uh, is much greater in the younger individuals than it was uh, overall, um, and especially earlier in the pandemic. So a little bit about uh, the variants. Uh, we are doing surveillance for uh, variants of uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, this is uh, just looking at the proportion of variants of concern in North Dakota that have been reported. These are the four variants of concern uh, identified by CDC, the alpha variant, beta, uh, gamma, and delta. Uh, you can see early on, starting early in the year, uh, the alpha variant was the predominant variant. Uh, you see a scattering there of some betas and some gammas, um, but uh, very small numbers. And then you can see that our first uh, delta was reported that week of uh, uh, the 23rd of May. Uh, and that's those are dates of collection, the dates the specimens were collected actually. And you can see how rapidly the, the Delta variant uh, became the predominant variant in North Dakota circulating. And so it, when people are asking the question, you know, well, do I have Delta the Delta variant or don't I have the Delta variant? Well, there's a large, a very high probability that if you're being diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 in North Dakota that you are being diagnosed with a, the Delta variant at this point in time. We will continue our surveillance. As you know, this virus changes uh, rapidly uh, and new variants continue to emerge. Um, and so we'll continue our surveillance and, and as other variants emerge, we'll be able to detect them through the surveillance that we do in North Dakota. And I think Dr. Mason will talk a little bit about that maybe uh, in, in her presentation, uh, but I the, the last thing I wanted to mention before I um, um, turn it back to Molly is uh, there's a lot of questions about who should be tested and when should be when should I be tested and so I think from our perspective testing is still an important thing to do uh, and the number one rule is, is people who are symptomatic really should be seeking testing and the earlier they seek testing the better the better they understand that the sooner they understand what their diagnosis is, uh, the the more rapid treatment, more rapidly treatment can be uh, begin, and uh, the more rapidly they can take uh, precautions to protect others if they are COVID-19 positive. So if you're symptomatic, uh, if you're a close contact, you should also be tested, and you should consider being tested five to seven days uh, into your. Um, uh, after you've been notified of your close contact or after your close contact. 
So people who are unvaccinated may be at risk because they are not able to social distance, and those are individuals who who uh, should be uh, vac uh, vaccinated. For example, if you attended a large event, a large indoor event, or even a large outdoor event where social distancing and physical distancing was not possible, uh, then you should consider getting tested uh, after uh, after those high risk events. Uh, people who are referred to testing by their healthcare provider or by public health or by tribal health, uh, you should also consider being tested as you're being referred by those entities. Travelers um, should make, make sure that you're checking the requirements for your destination to see what testing is required. Uh, so it's important to know that it varies from area to area uh, and, and the traveler needs to take the responsibility for making sure that you understand uh, what testing requirements may be in place for your for where you're going. All air passengers coming into the United States will need to have a negative viral COVID-19 test and that test uh, should be done three days uh, before your departure uh, flight into the United States. And so uh, that's important to remember. Uh, and that's all passengers, whether vaccinated or not. Um, and then international travelers arriving in the United States are, re are recommended to have a test three to five days after uh, uh, returning or arriving into the United States. And again, that's regardless of vaccination status. And so that's the testing recommendations. And again, testing is still remains an important uh, part of our response. Uh, and again, uh, the, the big rule is, is if you're symptomatic, uh, you really should be seeking testing. So, all right, Molly. All right, thanks, Kirby. Uh, now we're gonna talk, turn it over to Dr. Christy Mason uh, to discuss the different types of tests that are available for COVID-19. Thank you, Molly. Um, yes, today I am just going to touch a little bit about the different options that are available for testing, as well as what we have at the public health lab. So, um, at the Public Health Lab, we currently offer um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR, and that test is going to detect the presence of the genetic material for the virus that causes um, COVID-19. And so that test just tells you at that point in time if there is virus present, um, and that's all it can tell us at that time. Um, it doesn't tell us if the person has influenza or um, if they had it a long time ago, um, it just gives us that information at that point in time of collection. But um, recently there has been an expansion of PCR tests and we refer to them as multiplex tests. And the, this is when we are mixing the test with other viruses or bacteria. So a multiplex PCR that has SARS-CoV-2 in it will detect the presence of that genetic material as well as what other, whatever other viruses or bacteria are also um, in that test. So for example, right now there are um, COVID-19 and influenza tests. There are other tests out there that will test for COVID-19, influenza, as well as RSV. And then there's also some really extensive uh, multiplex PCRs that will test you know, 10 to 13 or 14 other respiratory viruses and bacteria like parainfluenza, um, adenovirus, rhinovirus, and other viruses or bacteria like that. So lots of different options out there. Um, they are still very new. We have brought on a couple options here at the Department of Health, um, but a lot of these multiplex tests are used um, at healthcare facilities and larger hospitals um, as they're screening patients for different respiratory illnesses, not necessarily just COVID-19. But then on the flip side, we also have antibody tests. And these antibody tests are going to detect antibodies or your body's immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so if you have antibodies, you either were likely infected with that virus or have been vaccinated. All of these are options that we do have available at our lab. Also out there, and sure, lots of people have heard about the antigen tests. And these are a little bit different than PCR. 
and the fact that these tests, instead of detecting genetic material, are actually going to work to detect proteins from the virus that cause the disease in a respiratory specimen. These are great tests um, that are often used in a point of care testing setting where the tests are being completed at the time of collection or very close to the patient at the time of collection. The North Dakota Department of Health has various test events um, that we're supporting and the Abbott, Abbott Binax Now is the rapid antigen test that's being utilized at those facilities. A lot of times the positives will also be collected with PCR so that we can um, do further testing utilizing whole genome sequencing and things like that as we go further in the presentation I'll talk a little bit more about whole genome sequencing. But the benefit of these antigen tests is that they have a very fast turnaround time. So you get the answer you know with within a little while 15 minutes half hour of having your test collected whereas with PCR it takes a few hours to a couple of days to get those back because they have to get sent in either to a hospital lab where they're doing some PCR tests or if they're utilizing our facility, um, some, there may be some transport time where the specimens are getting sent to our laboratory and then we begin that processing of those specimens. So there's definitely some advantages to the antigen test over the PCR, but both are great tests. So the current status in the public health lab is that to date throughout this entire pandemic, we've actually done uh, more than 1.3 million COVID-19 related tests. Um, so we've definitely increased our volume, but in the last two weeks, we have done a uh, little over 28,000 PCR tests. Our capacity is to perform around 7,500 tests per day, and we're currently utilizing four different high throughput methods or different tests. Um, the largest contributor to our capacity um, is our Life Sciences Thermal Fisher um, Amplitude System, which is what's pictured here. It's a very robotic method that helps reduce human error and uh, allows for a large volume to go through our laboratory. Antibody tests are not utilized as often, but we do have a capacity to perform about 1,200 of those per day. And in the last two weeks, we've performed approximately 49 antibody tests. But once a specimen is um, positive on PCR, um, not the antigen, but once we get a PCR positive in the laboratory, we then take it to the next step of analysis where we perform what's called whole genome sequencing. And that analysis is going to map the genetic sequence of the virus. And that's what's gonna allow us to detect the SARS-CoV-2 variant. As Kirby stated, there's about 99% of the samples that are sequenced in our laboratory um, are the Delta variant right now. And I looked at just the last two weeks and that was about 99%. Once we have that data, that data doesn't go back to the patients or even the healthcare providers. That data is going back to the epidemiologists and Kirby's team for them to look at what's going on in the state. We also report that on a national level, we send that information to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC along with some other international databases to help map what's going on with this virus. One of the questions we get asked quite frequently is, um, how do we request this test? Um, this is not something that can be requested. This is just something that's part of our surveillance system, where when we have a positive, we work to sequence that virus so that we have a, an idea and a random sampling of what's going on or what's circulating in the population. Not everybody does get their specimen that are positive, they don't always get a sequence. Um, and this is because we have to have a really strong quality specimen. Um, it has to, can't be a very old specimen. It can't have gone through a lot of um, freezing um, and thawing cycles, which happens um, as the longer we have a specimen within our laboratory. Um, and so, or if the viral load is too small, then we, we really struggle to do a full map of that virus. And there's different criteria out there for what qualifies. There has to be, it has to meet a certain data quality for us to be able to submit that sequence for analysis. And so not everybody gets a sequence. Um, we are working very hard to sequence as many as we possibly can so that we have a really good grasp on what's going on in the population. And in addition to the samples that are submitted to us for PCR, 
We also request samples from the various hospitals and clinics across the state that are performing their own molecular tests. And we have them submit their positive samples to us so that we can mix them in so we get a really good representation of what's going on around North Dakota. And that is all I have for you today. Molly, I will turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mason. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to Dr. Ranham, and he's going to talk about uh, treatment options available for COVID-19. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Molly, and, and greetings to uh, everyone from West River Health Services. I'm actually at our Lemon, South Dakota clinic today, just across the border. Um, I have the uh, pleasure of talking about the really the first time, the first thing that we could actually take take the fight to the uh, the coronavirus rather than than reacting to it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the the monoclonal antibodies and um, if uh, from what my uh, my patients tell me, if you've been uh, paying attention to TV and and, and media, you've seen these things uh, advertised and and pushed and, and the Department of Health has really had a, uh, a very large awareness campaign to try and increase utilization and, and access uh, to these. And um, I do uh, credit the Department of Health and, and Governor Burgum for really um, getting on the forefront of this. I think we were one of the first states to, to develop an active um, deployment campaign and an awareness campaign and we really um, we're at the forefront of, of utilization uh, of these uh, back in the, the latter part of uh, 2020. So why are, why are these exciting? Um, they're, they're very exciting because uh, in uh, patients they're administered to, they, they cut the risk of hospitalization by about 70%. Um, that number was actually uh, quite a bit higher in our earlier data uh, prior to the, the Delta virus Delta variants emergence, uh, but right now it, it is uh, still holding strong at about 70%. And, and, and so what are they? And the, the picture on the screen uh, represents uh, sort of what the, the antibodies do. And, and the antibodies bind to uh, a, a, any sort of virus or bacteria that, they, that they've been exposed to, in this case, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and, and target it for destruction and uh, removal from the body. So rather than entering the cell where they can infect the cell and unleash all of their, their uh, uh, troublesome consequences, uh, these antibodies uh, bind to the, the, the virus and, and decrease the viral load. Um, you know, vaccines are still, you know, are right now are still uh, very, very highly recommended. Um, and, and still, the, you know, as a uh, now, you know, September 2021, our, our primary uh, weapon in the fight, but uh, um, um, these are have a very important role in those who have uh, uh, tested positive or, as we'll see a little bit later, a, a close contact. So um, the reason that uh, we've, we've seen such a effect with these and, and why they're important is, is again, the, the reduction in viral load. And, and it, we, we've seen, you know, time and again across this uh, illness that uh, a person's viral load really seems to uh, dictate their trajectory with the illness. Um, so prior to vaccines, when when people did not have a um, uh, an enhanced immunity against uh, uh, COVID, um, this this really you know tremendously decreased that viral load and and thus allowed the body to get a head start on building up its own immune response to the illness. Um, in terms of effectiveness, and it, we've talked about the effectiveness in terms of safety, um, very, very well tolerated. Um, there's a less than 1% um, risk of uh, uh, what we call injection site reactions, which would be a skin reaction, um, bruising, uh, et cetera. Um, most of these are given through an, an intravenous line, an IV line. Um, the casarivimab product can be given under the skin if an IV access is not obtainable or not feasible. And we do see a bit more side effects in the subcutaneous under the skin dosing rather than the IV. Um, 
with uh, all of these monoclonal antibodies, uh, so these would be also include commercial products like Humira or Enbrel, Stellara, things like that, that um, we also see advertised on TV. Um, always a concern about allergic reaction. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, this has been very, very, very rare. Um, well under 0.2% uh, incidence of allergic reaction. And um, in the uh, package inserts of these um, medications and on the FDA's sites, they, they do not have uh, any listed um, uh, fatal allergic reactions or, or very severe allergic reactions. Um, so there's, uh, there's three drug options right now available for uh, affected patients or, or close contacts. Um, and, and one caveat is, is these are under an FDA emergency use authorization. So the FDA has had found enough evidence of effectiveness and uh, also of safety to allow these to be on the market, but they've not gone through the full FDA approval process. Um, so there's uh, there's there's the three products out there. There's the Casarivimab and Devimab product uh, that also goes by the name Regeneron or Regenco V. Uh, this is the primary one that we're utilizing now. Um, it's one. It's uh, widely available. Two. It's highly effective against the uh, uh, the Delta variant. And, and three. The state has uh, qu quite the uh, um, uh, access to uh, the product and and uh, that distribution network. Um, the newest one on the on the market is a product called Citrovimab, and um, this has not really um, had any use uh, across the state, not because of any effectiveness or safety concerns. It's just more of an access and distribution issue. And the third product uh, is the Bamlanivimab Etisevimab uh, product. Uh, right now, this one is uh, on the shelf because this does not have the degree of effectiveness that we're looking at or that that's that we feel is necessary against the uh, the Delta variant, variant and uh, as was mentioned previously, 99% of the uh, isolates in the state right now are, are Delta. So um, uh, the first iteration of that was just bamlanivimab alone. And that's actually what a lot of us in the state got started with, and it it really worked nicely in the in the fall and and early part of the winter. Um, uh, but now the uh, bamlanivimab etisevimab is is on the shelf. Um, uh, next slide, please, uh, Clint. So, uh, who who should get these? And and really, um, uh, there used to be, if uh, uh, people remember from uh, previous uh, versions of the Department of Health website or um, uh, a flowchart that you may have seen um, after being tested, is is we've really kind of streamlined and, and simplified. Uh, these things. So one is as more and more people get that and we see more of uh, more positive effect in reducing hospitalization, severe outcomes and death. Um, we think that we should be expanding the access to this. Um, and the the other thing is, is we've correlated a lot of these different things with uh, higher risk uh, with the disease. So it's it's there's increased latitude for for giving these things and uh, uh, hopefully um, less barriers to to receiving these things. So right now uh, they're approved for 12 and older and a weight uh, uh, greater than 88 pounds. And again, that's just how it's been tested. Um, um, so that's that's the first um, the first kind of branch point there. And and really what we've tried to get across both to patients and clinicians is you know what we really want is there's a positive test or the next question should be is this patient a candidate for for monoclonal antibodies and that's that's you know that's really the reason for the public awareness campaign um, as well as there's been an equally strong if not uh, uh, more robust clinician awareness campaign because these things given early in the course of the disease really do uh, change a person's trajectory. So um, one thing that's not on that flow sheet and I, I had to uh, shrink it down for for space is um, 
you know, once the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak, and a person has low oxygen saturation or needs to be in the hospital for other reasons, uh, these monoclonal antibodies are no longer indicated. So these are people who have uh, tested positive for the disease, but have normal oxygen and are, are not uh, being hospitalized. So, um, and if we uh, kind of look at the, the middle of the, the screen there in that, uh, that middle box, um, so a, a body mass index, uh, greater than 25 or the 85th percentile, different hematologic disorders like sickle cell disease, heart disease, hypertension, chronic lung disease, pregnancy is an indication. These have been studied and are safe in, in pregnancy. Um, COVID during pregnancy is a high risk condition. Uh, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, immunosuppression, uh, either an immunosuppressing condition like HIV AIDS, or active immunosuppression, uh, such as treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, medical related technologic dependence. So things like feeding tubes, tracheostomy tubes, um, things like that, greater than or equal to age 65. Um, and then just an overall kind of assessment of the benefits of therapy would, uh, would, would outweigh the risks. So, um, you know, really there's been increased if you again compare that to previous versions of that um, flow sh flow sheet, we're, we're we're using these a lot more. So um, the uh, the original ones were sort of the hard and fast uh, rules where where there was a definite uh, trial benefit uh, for patients. Um, some of these things I I kind of. Uh, uh, call, uh, as, as you'll see on my next slide, the probably list. Um, and, and that's, you know, we've seen that higher BMI is is more problematic with this disease, pregnancy, the lung diseases, things like that. And so um, those indications have, have kind of expanded. So again, positive test, and, and as you'll see, or close contact. Um, Hospital, yes or no, and, and and if no, if the patient is not in the hospital, then really everybody's next question, patient and clinician, should be, is this person a candidate for monoclonal antibody? We, we want to get that out to as many people as possible. With given early in the course of the disease, again, a dramatic reduction in hospitalization, um, and, and really it, it's not designed to make people feel better, but a lot of people just anecdotally say, wow, within you know 24 hours of getting that infusion, I really kind of felt like I, I, I turned the corner. So um, once uh, identified as a candidate, then uh, working with the um, uh, your uh, you know personal uh, either the ER or the hospital or the your clinician to arrange for an infusion. Uh, the Department of Health also on their website, if uh, let's say you tested positive at a uh, walk-in screening test or, or something like that, on that on the Department of Health website, on that flow sheet or after I've been tested, they do have a contact number to help locate your closest infusion center as well. Um, and, and, and again, this is these are these are great products, really dramatically cutting risk of hospitalization, but you know still need to be kept uh, be be monitoring things and, and and be vigilant because there there is some progression. And the further after diagnosis these things are given, uh, the closer to that day seven or ten mark after the onset of symptoms, the less effective they are. Again, the virus has had that much of a head start to be able to uh, to get going. Um, Clint, uh, next slide, please. And just a, a word about uh, the, the the flow sheet had sort of that what I call my probably list on there. Uh, there is a very uh, uh, recent uh, shift in indication for uh, what's called post-exposure prophylaxis. So I've been a close contact of somebody with COVID, uh, but I don't have any symptoms or the diagnosis myself. Is, is there anything that can be done? And the casarivimab and devimab product does now have an indication for post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, I can't say that that's gotten necessarily a lot of use and traction yet, um, but, but it is out there. Uh, I know some of the nursing homes that I work with are developing protocols for, for post-exposure prophylaxis for, for those vulnerable re uh, residents. So the, the criteria for that is a person should be considered high risk um, which is is one of those conditions we we um, uh, 
um, mentioned before, but generally also it's uh, above the age of 65. And an immunosuppressive condition or state or not fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated is defined is defined as having the full series of vaccines and in at least two weeks with with those in the body. So, you know, let's say I, I have a patient who has had uh, both vaccines, you know, four months ago, and they're exposed with a close contact. They don't necessarily need post exposure prophylaxis. But you have a uh, a, a household where um, the husband tests positive and the wife who's uh, 67 has not been vaccinated, um, you know, that would be an indication potentially for that. So um, along with close monitoring and testing, uh, consideration for post-exposure uh, treatment. Now, again, this does not replace vaccination. This enhances the immune response, uh, which, which which we're, we're, we're after with the, uh, the vaccine. So, you know, in the last um, three, four weeks, as we've seen an ups, uptick in uh, COVID in, in, in our area, uh, we have seen breakthrough infections. Um, the people who have been vaccinated, they are staying out of the hospital, but uh, we've given, um, you know, several vaccinated people who've tested COVID positive and qualify monoclonal antibody just as an enhanced, um, treatment and enhanced protection against severe, severe illness and, and hospitalization. Um, so again, vaccines still highly recommended. That's the best thing that a person can do to protect themselves. Um, you know, the monoclonal antibodies are great, but it's kind of like figuring out which fire department to call rather than preventing fires in the first place. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Ranham. Uh, and then I think we're going to turn it over to Kirby quick. He was going to just touch briefly on ivermectin. Kirby, I will turn it over to you and then we should be able to take some Q&A. All right. Bear with me, Molly. OK, I'm going to get my slides up and then we'll be able to go here. So um, apologize. Um, so I just want to touch briefly on Iver ivermectin and the use of ivermectin. Um, and and uh, I know there's a lot of information out there that that uh, uh, that may indicate that ivermectin is, is effective, but I think what we're seeing and, and overall the data is just inconclusive on how how effective ivermectin is uh, for treatment. And so just going in, so ivermectin is a drug that is used to treat parasitic infections uh, or infestations. It's, this includes in parasitic worms, scabies, and head lice. And it is food, food and drug administrative administration approved for this, but uh, it's limited to this scope of treatment. That's what the uh, approval is for. Uh, so, but there are other formulations of ivermectin that are out there. Uh, there's ivermectin that is can be used for veterinary use, uh, but and it's again, the, the indication even in the veterinary world is for treatment of parasitic infections or infestations in animals and not above that. Um, so several federal agencies have made statements recently regarding ivermectin and the use of ivermectin for treatment of COVID-19. Uh, and the first I will talk about is the FDA. The FDA has not approved ivermectin uh, for treating or preventing COVID-19 in humans. Um, again, it's been approved for very specific reasons, and that's for treat treatment of parasites or for a skin condition called rosacea. Uh, taking large doses of the drug is is dangerous. Uh, it can cause some serious harm. Uh, if you have a prescription, you should be getting that from a reliable source, and, sh and you should be taking the drug for an FDA-approved reason, uh, following the direction of your uh, doctor. Uh, never use medication intended for animals on yourself. Uh, ivermectin preparations uh, that are prepared for animals are much different than what are being prepared for. Uh, people. 
So recently, the American Medical Association, the American Pharmacists Association, and the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists issued a joint statement indicating that they're, they're concerned for the use of ivermectin in the treatment of COVID-19. And basically, I'm just going to read this to you, and you can read it yourself. We are alarmed by reports that outpatient prescribing for and dispensing of ivermectin have increased 24-fold since before the pandemic and increased exponentially over the past few months. In such, we are calling for an immediate end to the prescribing, dispensing, and use of ivermectin for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 outside of clinical trials. And there are numerous clinical trials that are occurring in the United States, uh, and they, they continue. Uh, so, so that's where uh, we get that important information on is this effective and is it safe? And until those clinical trials are completed, we don't really have those answers yet. So another group I want to just talk briefly about is the Infectious Disease Society of America. This is a, 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 a group of uh, infectious disease experts. Uh, there are two recommendations, recommendation 20 and recommendation 21 from their COVID treatment uh, guidance. Uh, basically says that uh, they, they suggest against the use of ivermectin for both hospitalized and non-hospitalized persons who have COVID-19. So, and again, uh, saying that uh, anything, uh, any kind of treatment that is occurring with ivermectin should be done in the context of a clinical trial. Merck, who's the manufacturer of um, uh, ivermectin, uh, also has released information, and this is dating back to February, uh, basically stating there's no scientific evidence to support the therapeutic effect for ivermectin for COVID-19. Uh, the evidence that is available for clinical activity uh, is not sufficient, and there's a concerning lack of safety data in the majority of the studies that have been done. So they have expressed their, uh, their uh, concerns there. And then the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention just recently came out with this statement, clinical trials and observational studies to evaluate the use of ivermectin to prevent and treat COVID-19 in humans has not yielded or has yielded insufficient evidence for the National Institutes of Health COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel to recommend its use. And so at the end of the day, there just isn't a lot of data to indicate that uh, um, COVID 19, uh, excuse me, ivermectin is a, an important uh, and reliable um, and effective treatment for COVID-19 treatment or prevention. So CDC also uh, recently issued some other findings. Um, uh, they had indicated that calls to poison control centers regarding ivermectin exposures have increased fivefold from pre-pandemic pre levels, going back to prior to uh, um, 2020. Uh, and these calls have related to ingesting ivermectin products obtained without a prescription, so being used without the, uh, the direction of, of a healthcare provider, ingesting ivermectin products that were intended for external use only, uh, and ingesting ivermectin products intended for veterinary medical use only, so treating animals. So ivermectin for veterinary use, uh, these formulations uh, may contain ingredients that are not found in, in formulations that are uh, of ivermectin intended for people. Uh, they may contain very high concentrations of ivermectin. Um, uh, you know, a horse and a, treating a horse and a cow where have very high uh, body mass, you need very high concentrations of the medication compared to what you would use for treating a human. And so it's just important to know that those concentrations may be very high compared to what human formulations are. And then are, are not to be used for any treatment of any condition in people, period. That's probably the, the basic rule for ivermectin and veterinary use. Any medication really manufactured for uh, veterinary use. So there are adverse effects of ivermectin and when it, the ivermectin is taken in doses above and beyond what's indicated. These can include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, decreased consciousness, confusion, hallucinations, seizures, coma, and death. So Dr. Ranum did a great job of talking about some of the therapies that are authorized by uh, um, uh, FDA for uh, 
treatment of COVID-19 and the prevention of COVID-19. He talked about the monoclonal antibodies for illness not requiring hospitalizations, uh, and then monoclonal antibodies for people who are exposed and high risk but may, may not be ill. And this is a relatively new indication for monoclonal antibodies to prevent illness uh, altogether. Then there are antivirals. Remdesivir uh, has been authorized for uh, treatment. Uh, there are steroids that are, are recommended, and then there's immunomodulators that can be used for those people who have more severe disease and are hospitalized. So there are a variety of things that have been authorized for use by the uh, FDA uh, to treat uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, and I think the bottom line is, is that these are the therapies that have had have shown in clinical trials uh, to uh, be uh, effective in helping to reduce severe outcomes, uh, shorten hospitalizations, and, and uh, other things like that. So I guess that's all I have, Molly. Uh, so I guess we're open for questions, so. All right, well, thank you to all of our speakers. And it looks like we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, we also have Nikki Brunel on the webinar as well. Um, she's our chief nurse for the Department of Health and can answer any questions regarding uh, COVID testing in the state in terms of where to get tested. Uh, and so maybe we'll start with that. Nikki, um, we got one question about where people can go and get tested for COVID. And then also what is the cost associated with COVID-19 testing in North Dakota? So we have a large list of testing locations across the state on our ndhealth.gov website under testing locations um, with multiple testing sites in most of the local public health areas as well as the FQHC clinics. For our testing that is performed in the state at these testing sites, tests are free. Um, we do not charge for testing or the vaccination clinics that are set up in our areas. Um, however, there are some private um, facilities, private health facilities that do charge for testing, but they are processing their own tests and purchasing their own tests. So um, a phone call, um, we have the numbers listed for all of the testing locations can give you more information. All right, great. Dr. Mason, uh, we got some questions. So can you just go over the PCR testing again for COVID? Um, if somebody receives a PCR test for COVID, um, is that test able to differentiate between COVID and other viruses like flu and RSV? And is it able to differentiate between SARS-CoV-2 and, and other coronaviruses or previous SARS viruses? Yes, I am happy to do that. So um, a lot of the tests that are being performed right now and the mass volume that's being produced right now is just a single assay for the detection of SARS-CoV-2. Um, the great thing about PCR is because they're looking specifically at the genetic material of the virus. Um, we are able to confidently say that it is SARS-CoV-2 and not a different coronavirus. Um, but to differentiate it from a different virus or a different respiratory pathogen, you would need a multiplex test. So for example, um, we would want to combine uh, markers for SARS-CoV-2, influenza, RSV, and other pathogens. And in that case, then yes, you'll get a result for each one of those pathogens that were being tested for. Um, so you, then you would know if you have influenza or if you've got coronavirus, or you know, COVID-19 or RSV or whatever else is being tested. So it's very dependent on the test that's being performed. Um, trying to remember what the other part of your question was. <laughs> no, I think I think I think that answered the question. Um, just trying to understand if the PCR. Oh, I we did get another question. What if somebody just has a common cold? Um, will they end up being PCR positive for COVID? Uh, because they have a common cold or can a common cold cause the PCR test to be positive for COVID? No, um, that's the great thing about PCR is that it's very specific. And so when you have a positive, then we, we're fairly confident that that is, that is the virus that you are being infected with. And um, actually each test has uh, three different markers that are specific for SARS-CoV-2. 
um, in versus other coronaviruses. So three different markers are indicating that this is the particular virus we're looking for if it's detected. Right. Thanks, Dr. Mason. Uh, and then just some questions about monoclonal antibodies. Dr. Random, can you go over again if so if I'm a member of the public, I go into a public testing site and I test positive for COVID-19, what should I do um, if I'm interested in monoclonal antibody therapy or how do I know if I need monoclonal antibody therapy? Yeah, um, yeah, excellent uh, clarification point there. So um, with, with any type of testing scenario, somebody should be in contact with you regarding your, your positivity or, or negativity. So uh, right now, just in the context um, of the, the patient testing positive, um, we have uh, worked with the Department of Health. So when, when patients are called, with their results, uh, that part of that that sort of scripting and that and those instructions uh, should include a resource or um, how to get connected with an infusion center uh, for orders. Uh, if and, and that actually has been the public health end of it has been has been quite good at doing that. Um, testing positive through a healthcare facility such as you know ER clinic. Um, doctor's office, uh, things like that. Uh, again, we're, we've been trying to get the mantra out for both uh, patients and uh, clinicians that okay, positive test, not hospitalized. Boom, let's let let let's get connected. And right now, almost all of our critical access hospitals or smaller hospitals across the state have the capacity to do this. Uh, our uh, larger hospitals um, across the state also have the capacity either in the hospital or an infusion center, kind of depending on how they have things set up. So, um, you know, really it's, uh, um, so the Department of Health um, will, will help facilitate uh, someone. Um, there is a, a link or a phone number uh, that patients can call if they've tested positive or, and are unsure if they're uh, eligible for that or not. We'll try to have those in the announcements at the end of the show. Um, and, and, and again, just the, the message is out there for both patients and clinicians. It does not hurt to ask, hey, am I eligible for this? And if so, how do I how do I get connected with it? And, and we've been trying to um, um, get that message out and, and make it as seamless as possible. Um, in some ways, now that we're using essentially one product across the state, uh, that almost is is a little bit easier. And I do know that uh, everybody's uh, that wants to has gotten an infusion program up and running. So I think we did a did a number. I mean, I think the furthest a person is from an infusion center is like 45 miles or something in the uh, across the state. So it's 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 quite good access all the way across the state. Great. Um. And then just another question on monoclonal antibodies. Uh, do people have to start them within 10 days from when they develop symptoms? Or what if it's past 10 days, can they still access monoclonal antibody treatment? So that um, the, the 10 days comes from uh, the, the, the onset of symptoms and the general trajectory of COVID is again, not 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 perfect, but um, um, typically the illness has bottomed out and and um, uh, by about day somewhere between day seven and ten. So the reason the ten day mark sort of came from is is by then uh, it's a low likelihood of progression to a severe illness. Um, you know, using it past day ten, that would be what's called an off-label use. And you know, clinicians still have autonomy and judgment to to use that past the ten day mark. Let's say somebody has a chronic cough and and maybe you can't tell exactly when that maybe started to get worse. Um, you know, that'd be a situation where you could think about it. But in general, uh, and what I've seen, you know, yeah, it goes out to 10 days, but, you know, in general, what I've seen is is the, the further, the closer you are to that 10 day mark, um, you know, the less effective or the less necessary even they are. People have either generally started to worsen to the point where they need uh, the hospital and oxygen support and, and, and those types of uh, treatments, 
or the patient is starting to get better and, and doesn't necessarily um, benefit uh, greatly from, from that treatment. So um, it would be an off-label use past day 10. Um, there is still room for judgment, but in most cases, you're either needing the hospital or getting better on your own by then, which, which um, is kind of why that 10-day mark is out there. Okay, um, Dr. Mason, we received some questions on PCR cycles. So can you talk about what PCR cycles are and what that means um, in terms of when people test positive, if they have high cycles um, and, and kind of uh, more on that topic? Sure. So the PCR tests, are the polymerase chain reaction tests are going to cycle multiple times. And these repeated cycles are what allows the test to replicate and amplify the genetic material um, if it's present in that sample. Um, and then it's going to go through that multiple times until it reaches a detectable level. And um, the value at which a sample becomes detectable or crosses that um, what we call cycle threshold or that positivity threshold is going to then indicate that they're positive or that we detect that genetic material in that sample. Um, I will tell you that um, we utilize lots of different methods in our laboratory. Not everyone uses what everybody is saying is cycle thresholds. There's also cycle numbers. We have different methods um, that don't utilize cycles at all, um, but the two large ones that we do utilize are the Thermal Fisher platform and the Amplitude system. Um, and the Thermal Fisher system will uh, go through 37 cycles and the Amplitude system will go through 40 cycles. And so at some point, the patient sample will have to cross that positive line within those 37 or 40 cycles. Um, but again, the 37 and the 40, that's just the set number that the manufacturers have designated as the performance of the test. Um, and then when a patient becomes positive, that number um, or their CT value is not something that is a published or reported value. Um, the methods that we utilize at the public health lab are qualitative, meaning we are just going to say whether it's detected or not detected not a viral load or um, or a, a CT value that's going to give some sort of diagnostic value. Okay, um, we did have a question on whether or not we've seen uh, overdoses related to ivermectin in North Dakota. Kirby, I know, I believe you requested some poison control data. Um, is North Dakota seeing overdoses related to ivermectin? So, you know, the, the data that we have is sort of limited on this. And so we did reach out to Poison Control uh, and asked about North Dakota residents. And uh, uh, we have had a couple of, Poison Control has had a couple of calls from North Dakota residents. One was an inadvertent exposure um, related to a veterinary product. And the other one was uh, uh, an intentional use of, of a human formulation of ivermectin uh, without a prescription. Uh, thankfully, neither one of them um, didn't sound like they were uh, came out with very severe uh, outcomes. And so that's good news. And the good news is that those are the only two that we're aware of that that poison control could report. So we would like to keep it that way. We really love love it if uh, we can keep that number really, really low. We don't need any adverse events due to ivermectin in North Dakota. And Dr. Ranum, we did get a question uh, for people who have loved ones in long-term care facilities. If they test positive for COVID, is there a way that they can receive monoclonal antibody treatment? So, yes, there is. And in general, um, because of when these things came on the market, there was the concern about allergic reaction and um, uh, how, how that could be responded to. Um, we still are using these in the infusion centers. I know there's a, a handful of nursing homes that have looked at kind of standing up their own infu infusion unit, um, met with some of the, the barriers just with um, 
anaphylaxis response and, and airways and those types of things in case there's an adverse event. Now, fortunately, adverse events are incredibly low, um, but for the most part, we're uh, positive nursing home residents, we're referring to an infusion center to, to have that um, medication. All right, and we're coming up on 1.30, so um, just maybe one last question here. Uh, Dr. Ranham, as a practicing physician, uh, are you seeing a difference in people who accepted the vaccine? Are they also willing to accept monoclonal antibody treatment? Um, or uh, are you getting a lot of requests for ivermectin in your practice? And how are you handling that? So I would say, um, Acceptance of, of monoclonal antibodies has been actually quite high um, from from the, from the start. Uh, it took a you know a few weeks after we kind of rolled out the program for people to start figuring out what it was, and eventually somebody knows somebody who got it and and felt better or stayed out of the hospital even though they'd be a, they'd be a high risk patient. So I, I would say out of tr out of the on the list of treatment acceptance, I would say monoclonals has been probably the highest. Uh, unfortunately, we'd like to see vaccines uh, at or above that level as well. Uh, but even in, in patients um, who have not chosen to be vaccinated yet, um, uh, there's still a fairly high uh, acceptance of the, the, the monoclonal treatments. Um, you know, the ivermectin issue is interesting. We, of course, live out in um, uh, farm and ranch country. And so I had a lot of people tell me that they're you know, the uh, the cows didn't get their full dose of ivermectin because some of it uh, uh, accidentally went uh, went down the hatch. Um, you know, a, a lot of that for us have it comes with having uh, a rapport and a relationship with with patients and sort of going through the the knowns and the unknowns with that. And, and, and right now there's there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, if we think back during the course of this disease, first it was hydroxychloroquine, then azithromycin, then, you know, what, whatever else. And, you know, I know some places in the world are, are certainly using this. Um, again, not a lot of data signal with that, but it's something that is, um, I guess, to, to, to use the phrase, sometimes you throw a bunch of things against the wall and, and, and see what sticks. And so, um, you, you know, we, we, could could it be something that um, you know in the near future is is has a role you know potentially um, you know we just we just have not seen that uh, that that data signal yet so you know really just try to work with uh, work with people and and kind of come to a mutual understanding and 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 rationale with that and it's um, um, you know typically a, a, a productive discussion and and certainly for the the high risk people there's um more efficacious things uh, out there that we that we know work and are well tolerated all right well we are a little past 1 30 so i want to thank our three speakers for presenting and answering quite a bit of questions today i know we didn't get to all the questions but i tried to get to most of them where it was kind of a recurring theme or a lot of people seem to have the same question um, and we will be doing future town halls, so just be on the lookout for town halls in the future regarding COVID-19. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, this will be posted on our Facebook page for viewing at a later date and will also be available on the North Dakota Department of Health YouTube page. So thank you, everyone.